Hey, what's up? Leron here. Thank you for joining me in another video. In this one, we're going to paint this lovely scene with a lot of emphasis on the architecture. Uh, there's everything that you, you love about watercolor here, uh, wet and wet, dry brush, a lot of interesting techniques in combining different areas and different shapes. And I just think it's a fun process uh, to look at. I love all these architectural beat, bits up top and I think they work out really well. So with that, let's take it to the table and go at it. So I'm going to start with the drawing stage. Now, this is all going to be real time. I wanted to show you the full process, but as always, there's going to be timestamps in the description box. You can scroll uh, with the bar and you'll find the painting stage in case you want to mix, uh, you want to skip it. So now there are a couple of complex things going on here when it comes to the drawing. I'm going to try and best explain, but I do plan on doing a more detailed video on comp on uh, perspective and some more advanced uh, perspective concepts. So what we have here is a tower from the Hearst Castle. Um, Hearst Castle or Palace, I believe it's a castle. Um, and we're looking at it from below. So what happens is notice how the lines that are supposedly vertical aren't really vertical, they're leaning if you compare it to the side of the photo. This happens because when we look at things from below, the all of the parallel lines actually also converge to a vanishing point that's up, up towards infinity, basically. So the lines on the right side of the structure lean a little to the left, and the more you move to the left, the more they lean to the right. Okay, so it's kind of a fanning motion. Imagine there's a dot really up above the drawing and then you pull out from that lines towards the bottom. So all sorts of lines directly downwards, a little to the right, a little to the left diagonally. And this is what you get. Okay, it's a very gentle effect, but it's still important. Now we also have the second, <laughs> the two points perspective in addition to that third one. So the right wall, if you look at the very bottom, the right wall of the tower, uh, all of its direct, uh, straight, uh, not straight lines, but rather uh, um, parallel lines all converge to this vanishing point that's to the lower right uh, angle. And the left side of the wall that's actually facing towards us, okay, is all of these lines go to the left. I will address this in a more specific manner. But what's important to understand is before I even address the accurate uh, perspective, first you see me do all these cloudy lines, very soft, okay? So even if you don't know uh, perspective, you can still use these soft lines and really observe the reference carefully, and you may be able to get some level of accuracy like that. Before I give it structure, I like to first do a very cloudy, soft sketch, because that will... I do want to know where to place everything before I go to, to the, the actual final lines. So I do one of these quick sketches just to get the cloudy shape of everything so that I know that the cross is near the top of the page, the bottom right side of the tower is around the bottom corner, I have enough room for the trees and all of that, and then I go into placing things in perspective. Now my perspective here is not perfect, okay, There's there are plenty of mistakes, some of the lines don't converge that well into the vanishing points. But my goal here from the get was to just enjoy a painting process and have some fun. It wasn't really um, that serious of a process and I didn't want to put emphasis necessarily on, because otherwise it would be a drawing stage that would take much, much longer. And I just didn't want that for this one, but maybe in a future one I will do that. Okay, you see, once every uh, while I'll do a video that's highly detailed and so, the drawing stage alone may take like a good 12, 15 minutes. And that's not even a lot of time. Uh, very often I'll devote more time if the end result, the desired end result is a pencil sketch. But as we're dealing with watercolor, um, I don't have to finalize anything with the pencil. So uh, you actually don't need that many details. Now, uh, another tricky thing about these structures is look at how not the bottom part, but the upper parts are divided into, uh, so it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sides. So it's a circle with eight flat sides. I don't know what you'd call this. Um, not hexagonal, but octagonal maybe. Um, so this is hard to get because 
the, f the wall that's facing towards us has the same vanishing point as the bottom part, but then you get these angles. Now, I'm not gonna claim to be a master of this, and in fact, I messed up some of the perspective here for sure, because I was hurried and I was trying, uh, in a hurry, and I was trying to paint a little looser, but um, if you look at the diagonals, so the left one should be much more tightly squeezed because it's facing away from us, while the one that's to the right, uh, of the wall facing towards us should be a little wider, okay? So I have a lot of mess ups here, um, but that's fine. Again, if you work from observation, you have the answers in front of you, so do your best to get them and supplement it with knowledge of perspective, of understanding what it is you're drawing, okay? Um, I have some of that knowledge, but uh, again, sometimes if you work fast and you don't really uh, care too much about these things, you won't get the most accurate result. So here's the first wash. Now I will leave paper white. Everything you see that's perfectly white, uh, I'm gonna leave white. Now the big challenge is on getting an even wash, getting it to be interesting while maintaining those highlights and while switching the colors and temperature and all of that. Uh, so it is a challenging wash sometimes, the first wash, but remember, no matter how badly you mess it up, it's still not the end of the world and you can salvage pretty much everything as long as you don't go too dark. And it's fairly hard to go too dark, I would say, uh, because you have to use a lot of paint and that's not uh, most people's tendency. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Now, as I'm moving downwards, okay, I got the sky that's going to be kind of a phthalo blue with a bit of French ultramarine mixed within that. But then I'm going to move towards the nickel as a yellow and a warmer mix for the actual building. Okay, the actual structure that's going to be uh, warmer. Uh, that's a decision I made. It's not warmer in the reference photo. And again, my, my goal here was not a realistic rendering of it. It's more about having fun and painting loosely and enjoying the shapes. Uh, but had I done this realistically, the mixing would take much longer. I would make sure to match the colors I see. Uh, it's something I'm not that good at either. So I hope to improve that skill in the future. But you see, this is a very strong yellow. I don't mind to use a very strong yellow because first I know that I'm going to mute some of it. In the next wash, I'm going to put a blue glaze on top of it or a gray glaze. It's going to be a, gla a gray one. And second, because it's uh, up high close to the sun in theory, uh, I want this part to be the warmest. So as I move downwards, I'm going to, uh, not necessarily the warmest, but pretty warm. As I move downwards, I'm going to start muting a bit. There's going to be more red, but I will also mute it. So there's going to be a lot more brown and a lot more purpley, greeny, uh, grace. Okay. Now, as I'm moving with this wash, I'm, I have to be aware of the edges of the shape. So the blue on the right is going to dry. I have to be aware of that. The blue on the left. So uh, as I'm rendering the shapes of the shadows that I see while leaving the white highlights, I'm also very aware of some of my edges there. And yeah, this stage you have to work fast. Now, if you want to make it easier on yourself, and that's I always give this tip, mix more water. You have to mix more water into your uh, mixtures and mix more paint, larger amounts, especially, and here I sprayed some water, especially if you have a large wash like this, you have to be prepared. So I'm fully for mixing a large well of blue color, then mixing a large well of yellow color and having those ready before you start the wash, okay? I'm all for it. Um, I don't do that as often, but I'm for it, okay? I don't see any problem with doing it this way. Um, in fact, it can really save you with uh, larger washes. I do uh, mix in advance uh, when I am working on larger pieces. This is fairly small. When I work larger, I'll definitely have to do that kind of pre-mixing. Otherwise, I'm going to mess it up. Um, and, you know, you don't want to lose the freshness of the wash while you're rendering all these strange details <laughs> that you see here. Now, again, remember, a painting is an illusion. You just, you just look at this thing. It's I'm really just creating an illusion around what I see. It's my own impression. It's the great privilege of painting, you know, doing watercolor and painting loosely. It's that you really can go pretty wild and you don't have to worry too much about being hyper accurate. You can work fast in, a, in an energetic way. Um, you don't have to work slowly and very calculated. And, and that's what I love about watercolor painting. I do love the accurate aspect and I am doing more of that, especially in the last couple of months. But um, I love that, you know, that freedom. That That's the thing that really 
uh, provides a lot of joy and fun for me. All of these fun, whimsical lines you see here, very confident, very on the first go. And even if they're not perfect, they're still beautiful, you know. <laughs> Looking at this, the, the inaccuracies of my perspective are really jarring. Um, I think I would approach this a little differently if I had to be accurate. I draw uh, one line or rather a few lines representing the, the perspective, sorry, and then I'd go a little uh, more with the specific lines um, I would first really establish that perspective, um, but in any case, yeah. So this is basically the almost the end of the first wash. Uh, I do want to make use of some wet and wet, so you will see me putting in some of these windows and some of these details. There's this nice dark line running across this section that I really wanted to get in. I love getting these effects. Now remember, we're at the bottom of the painting. Uh, it's it's gonna be an area that's fairly in the shadow. I don't want this to take too much attention. So whatever I can produce wet and wet here is better. I'm gonna let it spread out. It's not gonna be too shouty, too specific, too clear. It's all gonna blend together. Okay, so that's really important. Just like I showed you with the uh, boat in the last video, I showed you how the shadow and all of the details within that. And it's really things you have to pay attention to and, and make sure the painting works on a whole, you know. Uh, so now this is dry and we're moving on to the second wash. <coughs> this requires a little more uh, careful work, at least for the first few stages. So you see I'm rendering the shapes rather carefully. Um, but as I move along downwards and there's going to be larger areas, uh, I will have more the ability to have more freedom. Now, I'm inventing this shadow. It's not really there to cast shadow by the cross. Uh, I just thought it would look really, really nice. Now, notice it's a rounded do dome up top. So I'll soon uh, wet the clean the brush, dry it, and then blend some of that. But first, I just want to make sure that I get some of these negative shapes in. So there are some details in the shadow and there's also those um, triangular sharp poles facing upwards, these decora decorations. Um, these you have to paint around and just leave them very carefully. Try squinting your eyes. Here I'm blending that edge I told you about. Try squinting your eyes and seeing uh, and you see how it gives it this round feeling. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so yeah, try squinting your eyes, seeing where the whites are, the highlights are, and you just have to paint around them. This is fun. I love this stage, even though it's a challenge. Now, by the way, I'm going to switch to a larger brush. This is way too small. You see, I'm, um, as soon as I finish with these small sections, the, this brush is too small. It's practically useless for these sizes and I do get asked a lot about brush size I find that I have to have at least for this smaller size a 12 size smaller than 12 already will have me working fairly hard and having to work really fast and I'm gonna run out of water in the brush uh, really quickly so you see I switched to a larger one and I'd much rather you use a too large a brush and be very careful with its edge or even don't be careful, rather than, you know, filling in areas like a coloring book, getting a lot of uneven washes. That's my way of doing it. I do know of artists that work smaller brushes and still somehow get the result uh, to look beautiful and flowy. I just don't feel like I have that skill, and I don't know if it's a weather thing, because here it's warmer, so maybe the paint dries faster. I do see a lot of people that have more leeway with that it just seems like the paint doesn't dry some of that has to do with stretching the paper you know we pre-wet it um it can help but not always and i do think it's a matter of climate as well um so yeah i feel like if i work with a small brush i just won't be able to get all the details in i want but sometimes it's amazing what people can achieve with those i'm just not for working too hard um, and having the, the material work against you, being in a race against the clock, that's not really something I'm interested in, so yeah. Now, while this area is wet, I'm gonna do a lot of wet and wets, okay? It's really important, I'm trying to dig out some French ultramarine, I end up giving up on it. Um, but what I wanna do is just put in those shadows within shadows, and even though it looks a little dark right now, it's gonna dry a little lighter, don't worry about that. Um, I do want to get those uh, shadows in wet and wet just so that I can create some s sort of a blended feeling within the shadow. Okay, it's not it's not meant to be too strong, these windows. They're not meant to be too visible. That's what creates the beautiful balance with the right side. Okay, 
um, when you have this right side, it's very sharp and clear in the light, and you can see the bells within uh, inside the tower, but on the left side, you can't see a lot of that. It's all merged together with the shadow. And because I left, it's a wet enough of a wash, I'm not going to lose the edge. You see, so it's going to flow now that I fill up this gap. It's going to flow downwards, just painting around this lovely highlight in the corner there. Um, and it's okay if you miss highlights, as you'll see later on. Uh, I am adding quite a lot with opaque paint. One thing I would want to fix um, with these kinds of works is I just feel like my shapes here aren't as accurate as they could have been. Uh, and I really can see it now, especially like these edges with, there's a lot of architectural details that are very pretty and beautiful. And I would love to get those in as well. Um, and just when I work fast, sometimes I don't pay attention to these things. So it's definitely something for me to work on and improve. Um, and yeah, it has also to do with the size. So if you work small, um, every small movement you do with the brush uh, matters and it will have a huge impact. By the way, this is incredibly important. The wet and wet details I'm doing now are incredibly important. You'll see they'll be s very significant in the end result and getting it to look right. You'll see once it dries, it's really significant. But yeah, in any case, um, I think shapes, you know, I could have let it... Um, allow it some more time to get them more accurately, especially these small details here. On the one hand, you don't want to be too um, fussy and messy with them and, and really fall into a deep hole of having to convey each and every small thing you see, unless that's the style you're aiming for, obviously. But when you're doing these impressionistic works, you want to hint at it. Now, my skill of hinting at it could improve. That's that's what I'm saying. Uh, the way I do these shapes could improve. One of the artists I really uh, enjoy in that sense is Sergei Kuznetsov. Um, he has a really good Instagram account. You want to check it out. Um, it's called Uragan Kuznetsov. Uragan, U-R-A-G-A-N. Uh, Kuznetsov, K-U-Z-N-E-T-S-O-V, I'm so bad at spelling, um, when I have to read it out loud, but when I write it, I'm fine. Uh, so yeah, he's really good in architecture, he was the chief architect of Moscow, uh, so <laughs> he knows what he's doing. I did also a painting master's episode on him, so you may want to check that out. He's really good at rendering those details. Actually, I'm going to, while I'm recording this, I'm going to check for you what number of uh, Painting Masters episode it was because it's 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 really good. So Painting Masters, Sergei Kuznetsov. So it's episode um, 34. You want to check it out. Episode 34. He's really good at rendering these types of buildings. Now, one thing I love about his work as well that I did not do here uh, is his colors are very, um, what do you call it? Sublime, I guess. I'm going to turn on the air condition. It's really hot. Um, and because you see me here using phthalo blue and quinacridone rose and some pyrrole scarlet and, and Nicolazzo yellow. What he does is use a lot of burnt sienna, French ultramarine, um, yellow ochre, a very muted kind of classic palette, maybe some burnt umber. He does have a bit of red in there, but for the most part, no phthalo blues that are way too strong and, and none of these, you know, too strong uh, pigments. So I think that's something I want to try more of. Um, Instead of having red be dominant, using uh, burnt sienna, instead of these sh screaming yellows to have a bit more of a yellow ochre. So I suppose I just need to get more of these paints and use them. Um, there is a, this gentleness that comes with these paints that are a little more muted, that when you put the strongly saturated colors, it just makes more sense, you know? Uh, now, I didn't talk too much about the palm tree, but it's actually a, a complex process. So I'm looking at, again, the shapes. It's all about the shapes. I'm looking at the tree, and I'm trying to figure out what the pattern of, of leaves is. There's a lot of these sharp leaves, um, and I'm painting the space within the, between them. That's a big part of it. Uh, and by doing so, I bring out their highlights. I will add later on some highlights for them, like an opaque paint. <coughs> my John Brilliant, the white, similar to Titanium White by Sh P uh, Shinhan PWC, uh, that I was asked about quite a lot uh, in the last video. It's just a really good color. Um, and, you know, I, I also get asked a lot about what brand to use, and I will do this this brief pause to talk about that. By the way, again, wet and wet here, really nice architectural details. 
Um, so yeah, just to a word about paint brands. My approach to this is this, is this. I have maybe 10 brands I really, really like. I like Daniel Smith, I like SAA, I like uh, M. Graham a lot, they're very soft. I like Schmincke, I like uh, Shinhan PWC, I love a lot of watercolor brands, White Knight, Windsor Newton are good, you know, maybe not, I don't like personally them as much as others, but I do like many of their paints, uh, individual paints as well. So, and by the way, this has dried and now I'm adding texture. Look at the bricks, they're very visible in the process, in the in the reference. So I want to get that feeling, it will give it solidity, it will solidify the walls, make them feel more three-dimensional, give it some volume and depth even, uh, because we're doing it at the bottom, that's closest to us, rather than at the top. You'll see me doing less and less of this the more I go up. Back to paint. You want to, one of the th main factors, determining factors in what brand you should go with, in my opinion, is logistics. It's just what's easy to get in your area. So uh, if you're in Europe, for example, Schmincke may be easier to get or White Knights. And, and White Knights is cheaper and it's such a good quality. It's really amazing paints, in my opinion. Schmincke are also great, a little more pricey, but really good quality. If you're in the US, Daniel Smith, uh, Windsor Newton are your better choices. Maybe M. Graham as well. They're, they're really good. And soft. If you like soft paints, then M. Graham, but everything will work, really. Unless you paint planner all the time, maybe M. Grams aren't as good of a choice, even though I've done that as well. Um, if you're in the UK, uh, SAA are really good and really cheap and very high quality. So it's more about logistics to me. Wherever you live, the paint that's easiest to get is also going to be the cheapest. So why not get that? Because there are so many good brands to li to get from. If you live in uh, in Asia or Southeast Asia, or I don't know, depending on the area, you get all these, the Holbeins and the uh, Shin, Shin Hand are really good. Here in particular, it's very easy to get... Um, uh, White Knights are the easiest to get, Windsor Newton are also quite easy to get, now we have also Daniel Smith but they're much more expensive so I wouldn't recommend these necessarily here if you live uh, here. Um, what else we have, uh, Shinhan are really easy to get, that's a great choice. Um, so it really is about logistics to me because all of these brands, it doesn't matter, you know, if you like a lot of reds, yeah, Daniel Smith is better. If you like a lot of uh, transparency, you have some brand. I forgot which ones, but some brands are better for that. If you prefer your colors to be single pigment, you know, it's just, it depends on what you love. If you love softness, again, M. Graham, they have honey in their paint. If you want the paint to be vegan, go with, um, which one was it? Ah, the vegan brand, it's, I forgot it, but it's really good. Um, Whatever you choose, you know, your criteria, logistics play a much more important role in that, in my opinion. Okay, so now back to the painting process. You see uh, down below, I have these bricks. Um, which one was the vegan brand? I think it was M. Grams. But in any case, I don't remember. But what I will say is that my brushes are uh, synthetic and they're really good. These Skoda travel sets uh, are all synthetic. If I'm not mistaken, they're really good. So if you don't want animal hair, that's the, the one to go with. Now, you see, I'm putting this window and I don't want it to be too strong because it's in the edge of the painting. So I'm taking my spray gun and I'm just spraying and letting it spread out. You see how the paint spreads out a bit? That's a really cool trick for you. You just use a spray water, water sprayer and you just make the paint move and diffuse okay you don't have to come back with the brush and more water that can be a little awkward sometimes okay uh, so now we're almost done uh, the main idea here is to just add a couple of more touches of this dry brush and then move on to the opaque white paint because obviously I have missed quite a lot of highlights here it's a big challenge to do the second wash get all the major air shadows in and skip all the um, all the highlights it's not easy Okay, so that's my point. So what I want you to do is uh, don't worry about it too much and you can add things later on in opaque paint. If you're a Puritan and you really want to just use, you know, transparent watercolors, sure, use masking tape or just be very, very careful. Okay, now what I'm going to do is put a palm tree there. I'm missing something like a, another element and you can see there is a tree to the left. I don't want to get that tree in. I'm going to get one behind. So you see I'm just using this, the side of the brush uh, I'm, I'm, it's at a lower angle with the paper and I'm rendering this tree, I'm just making it up, doing some of the, you know, the branches moving in different directions and hopefully that will balance the very stiff structure with some movement, I suppose. I don't want to go too dark here, I don't want to go too prominent, but just something in the background. And because I have a palm tree down below, I feel very comfortable with putting on another one. Now this tree shows 
between the leaves of the other one. So look at me carefully go between them and also underneath just to give the feeling that it's real and it's there and it's behind the tree in front of us. Okay, so that's another important thing. Lastly, I will put in some detail on the statues there. You see the small little statues. Notice how I move them completely. They're not in the same spots. Uh, I could be more responsible with these, but I tend to really go wacky sometimes, uh, especially if I just want to enjoy myself and go a little loose. Um, it could be interesting to do another uh, attempt at this. I still love to exaggerate some of the light and shadow conditions, so probably even a more serious attempt will end up being still quite different from the original. Okay, so now here comes my John Brilliant, the Shin, uh, Shinhan PWC paint, one of my favorites, uh, opaque whites with a slight warm, even, even pinkish tint. Um, I'd like to try one with more of a yellow ochre feeling to it, uh, maybe in the future, and I'm adding the statue that I did not include, so now I have one extra in the middle, <coughs> and I'm also adding these highlights that I missed uh, that are really cool. I, I love the way they look. And this is just improving what we already have, uh, making it a little better. Um, some of the missed shapes, uh, adding them back in. Um, I don't have a strategy for this. I'm not really going too carefully with the shapes I see. You see, it's just touches. If I feel like I'm missing some details in a spot, I'll add it there. If I feel like one spot is too empty, I'll add it there. Um, I'm still trying to adhere to the light and shadow situation here, so I'm not going to go with a highlight on the leftmost wall. That won't make sense. There's not going to be any light hitting the building directly there. Okay, so you just want to be careful with those stuff. Um, for example, here there is a very gentle light on top of that edge okay but the wall itself will not get a very light highlight at all okay and you have to be really careful about these stuff especially the leftmost wall again you see the with the octagonal shape the leftmost wall i don't think i add a highlight there if i have my bed but i don't think it's going to add a highlight there so here it's in the middle you get some light it's very gentle but if you look at the reference you'll see some thin strip of light that's reflected there and of course i'm exaggerating a lot of it. I'm adding a little more than, um, than I see. There's a small architectural detail there catching the light. All of these small things, you just want to look at them carefully, see where they fit and go with those. I don't have a problem of overworking my paintings when it comes to details, okay, maybe with the technique, but with details it doesn't happen to me that often, so I'm not worried about adding too much details. If you know you have a tendency to, just ask yourself this, does the painting need anything else? Is it perfect now or do I actually need to add something to it? If the if you look at your painting and you say, I don't think it needs anything, but I really would love to add more details, I would challenge you to maybe just let it go for a couple of hours, revisit it <laughs> the next day and see if you still feel the same way. If you feel like, no, it's perfect, I don't want to add anything, don't. I mean, there is no need to um, if it feels complete. Now, if you feel like it needs more details or you want to express something that's more detailed, go for it, of course. Just whatever you feel like the painting needs. Just don't feel like you have to add more and more and more details and don't feel like you... Um, don't feel like you... Don't be afraid of... At least that's what I'm trying to be. Not be afraid of too little details, you know. Um, whatever you do, do it out of courage, I guess. Or do it, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> do it out of fear, I don't care. Uh, in any case, we're almost almost done here. I'm trying to give advice that, that helped me, but, you know, th at the end of the day, find out what works best for you. And uh, So, yeah, here is the final result. This was a really fun one just to let go, and here it is uh, fully. And now let's wrap it up. Thank you so much for watching. I really do hope you uh, enjoyed this one. Let me know in a comment down below if you have, and also drop a like if you have. That really helps me reach more people with my videos. I really appreciate it. If you want to learn how to paint like me, let go. Enjoy the process and get the results you want be sure to check out the frustration free watercolor course link is always in the description box below i really really appreciate just you watching the videos and commenting and liking it means the world to me so thank you so much and i will see you again in the next video